Okay, so I think that's us going live now. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's Mind the Bleak webinar on hypoxic emergencies. We're really lucky to have um, Samsul and Annabelle here today. They're both F1s uh, talking about hypoxia. Just a reminder that we'll record this session. It will be uploaded to our Facebook page and we'll send out the link and materials if you're registered at mindthebleep.com forward slash webinar registration. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, and remember to ask lots of questions during the, uh, during the webinar. We'll try to get to all of them. Um, and if we don't, then we'll answer them in the comments. And make sure that you fill in the feedback form when it comes. You'll get a certificate of attendance, um, which, is, which is also great for you guys. So uh, just to start with, I'm going to hand you over to Dan Tyler from the BMA, um, who are very kindly supporting our webinar. So over to you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, so you should be able to see uh, see the presentation and and hear me now. Um, so yeah, uh, you would have seen. Um, hopefully, maybe they're not there yet. But there's there's a few links um, under underneath the the webinar. Um, so yeah, these these links and also there's there's a QR code on the screen. Um, so with those, um, if you if you use those, we'll send you a free digital support pack. So it doesn't mean you're signing up to membership. I'm from the BMA, by the way, I should, should mention that. Um, it's just a free uh, support pack to you. So regardless of, of whether you're a, me a member or not. Um, so with that, you'll, you'll get an employment guide, which is which is really useful looking ahead to F1. Um, we negotiated the contract so we so we know what should be um, in it and, and we sort of know inside out um, and, and that guide breaks it down. Um, you also get a, a student support pack featuring some some like revision tips and tricks. So uh, that may still be useful to you guys. Um, uh, also in there's like ethics toolkit um, and some other bits. So there's something for the remainder of your studies if, if you if you still got studies, um, and also the F1 guide. So again, doesn't matter if you're a member or not. It's just some some free guidance and, and info that we'd we'd like you to all have, um, and it'll be useful when it comes to your F1. Um, and and also obviously now uh, now you're you're still in med school. So that QR code will be uh, on the top left uh, of the presentation while I'm just doing my little bit. So feel free to do it while I'm talking, or again, you can follow the, the links in the chat. So yeah, so I'm Dan, uh, I'll just speak about uh, BMA membership, um, won't take too much time. Um, I'm sure you're all members or you've been a member at some point, so you know a bit about um, what the BMA does, what you, what you sort of get as a member as well. Um, so you can treat this as a bit of a refresher and hoping you might find out something new as well. Um, so we're the leading trade union and professional association for, for medical students and doctors in the UK. Um, we act as the voice of the profession, um, representing you on an individual, local uh, and national uh, basis on all the issues that affect you. Um, so, so while it'll be your job to look after patients, it's our job to, to look after you. Um, so we're not an indemnity company, um, so we're not like MD or MPS. Uh, we, we do get that confusion quite a bit, um, but so we don't deal with patient complaints. Um, we're here solely to look after you, your working conditions, so things like pay contracts um your well-being and also your your professional development um so we understand the sort of things you you may encounter particularly when when you become an f1 um, and we can give you advice and support on on any issues that you face um so again this can be on anything from from working hours to relationships with senior staff or, or any responsibilities you have that you don't quite feel comfortable with um so yeah so it's just good to just keep us in mind um we can take some of the pressure off you um if you're facing anything you feel that you need support with um we've seen most most things before and there's not much we can't help with um and we have relationships with every trust in the uk and, and it's our job to just look after you and make sure uh, the trust are being fair um so each trust as well we also have an industrial relations officer uh, based there um so so solely to sort of look after local issues and we've got an employment advisor that, that will be based at every trust so you can just speak to us and again independent of the of the trust but but we have a relationship with the trust um, so you may have heard of our contract checking service, uh, which can save you time and potentially quite a bit of money. Um, so it's, it's probably the key tool of ours that you'll, you'll need this year if, you, if you're going into F1. Um, so we'll aim to check your rotor, oh, sorry, we'll aim to check your contract within five working days, um, comparing it to the national model. Um, and if there's any problems, uh, we can help get it sorted. So they don't always mean to, but trust can, can sometimes slip in extra things to your contract or, or sort of change the wording to mean the opposite of what it should be. Um, and we just want to make sure your contracts are or what they should they should be. Um, so 20% of the contracts we checked last year uh, for the F1s uh, were incorrect. So it should be pretty standard, but, but but they made a bit of a hash of it. So that's one in five that we checked. Um, and it's just a bit too high. Uh, and we negotiated the contract, so we know it should be in it. So we just don't want them to try and sort of pulling any fast ones 
or mistakes, whatever whatever the reason was. Um, so also you can check your rotor is compliant um, by using our rotor checker. So with that one, you just enter in your rotor into our online tool and it'll flag up to us if it's wrong. But again, it should be pretty standard, your, your rotors. Uh, as most of you, you guys should be funny as, uh, I guess, uh, on this. So you're actually eligible for the, the weekly subscription to the BMJ as part of membership. So the actual doctor version, so not the not the student BMJ. Um, and that's delivered every Friday to the address you have registered with your membership. Um, so yeah, another perk for, for final years. If you're not getting it, it's because it's an opt-in service. So you just need to drop us an email and say, I'm a member, or give us a phone call and say, yep, yeah, I'm a member. I'd, I'd, I'd like to get the BMJ weekly and we'll start sending out to you. Um, alternatively to that, if you if you are getting them every week you cannot, and you don't want them every week, you can you can stop them by phoning as well. All of the copies are available to all year groups, uh, uh, all, year, all, all medical uh, students and all doctors on the BMJ app anyway. So, so if you'd rather just read them on your phone, you can do. Uh, as part of membership, you also get access to our clinical and non-clinical learning tools. So you've got full access to BMJ Learning, which has over a thousand clinical and non-clinical modules. Um, and there are courses uh, and modules helpful for beginning uh, your, your e-portfolio uh, when you begin your F1. Um, it's all very interactive and kept up to date with practice changing developments um, and there's lots of audio and video, video modules as well to help you learn in sort of more simulated environments um, and for each module you do you can print off a certificate as, as proof of learning. Um, so BMA library uh, has thousands of ebooks and, and e-journals you can access from anywhere. Uh, library itself is closed at the moment due to COVID still but but you can like I said you can access those ebooks and journals um, still through your phone or laptop. And um, we also have a series of we webinars that you can watch uh, throughout the year live and if you can't watch them uh, live you can watch them on demand as I'm sure some of you are watching this on demand. Um, uh, and if you're thinking about your specialty options already you can think you can use our specialty explorer tool um, and that, that helps you get a bit of a better picture of what suits you best. So it's an online psychometric test, which takes about 20 minutes to complete. Um, it'll ask all sorts of work-life balance questions. Then at the end, it'll give you a really detailed report um, listing the top specialities according to the answer you've given. Um, it's really easy to use and covers all the specialties and the reports are always really thorough with lots of analysis of the answer you've given. Um, nearly done from me. So uh, just, just one thing I want to mention is if you, if you feel uh, you'd like to speak to someone anytime about your well-being, um, we have services that are open 24-7 um, to all students and doctors, and it doesn't matter if you're a member or not, um, and you'll have the choice of if you've speaking to a counsellor or a peer support doctor. So it's a telephone-based service, and we do offer video calls as well if you prefer that, um, and we'll make sure you speak to the same counsellor again if it's more than a singular call to the service. So like I said, it doesn't matter if you're a member or not, anyone can use this, and it's, it's open 24-7 and completely um, confidential and independent of any trust or, or medical school. Um, so yeah, wrap it up for me. Um, if you're not if you're not a membership and you want to join, uh, you can use the link that's that's below in the in the comments, um, and you'll you'll get a, a ten pound Amazon voucher. Um, this works if you're joining for the first time or also rejoining, and obviously you're free to leave as, as you wish. Uh, membership for final year students uh, is three pounds six six a month, so the voucher sort of levels out three months, uh, and if you're starting, uh, if you are starting as an F1 in July, you'll actually still pay that £3.66 a month for through until October. So uh, if you wanted to join now, you'd still join as final year. Um, and once once October comes, it'll go up to £7.80 £7 a month uh, after tax relief. So you must use that that link or the, the QR code on the screen um, to get the voucher. Otherwise, if you just join through the, through the website, you won't get the voucher. Okay. Uh, Last slide for me. So yeah, same as the first one. If you don't feel ready to sign up or you don't, don't want to sign up, but you want to stay in touch, that's fine. You can just use that QR code or the link, the link I mentioned at the start, and you'll just get some sort of some like timely messages from us about your F1 transition uh, and also get another sort of like membership offer close to the time. It's advisable to join. Like I said, five one in five of the contracts we checked last year were, were wrong. So yeah. We just hope that you join and, and get your contract checked at, at least. Um, thanks, and, and that's it from me. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you very much for your support. Um, so everyone, it's really important that you you sign up to, to the BMA. Uh, Sam, are you there? Yes, hello. Hi. Hi. Would you mind just set, um, sharing, your, sharing your presentation? Yeah. Okay. 
And could we have just the MDU slide and then you can go back to this one. All right, well, uh, along with the BMA, we're very lucky to um, have the MDU, the Medical Defence Union, sponsoring us too. So just a very quick shout out to them. And um, it's really important that you sort out your MDU foundation membership before you start shadowing. And unless you've filled in a foundation application form, your student membership will cease in the summer. It's essential that you have indemnity cover. So check out the sign up links that I'm going to post in the chat. Um, and as Dan just said, uh, the BMA and the MDU do different things. Uh, so make sure that you're signed up to both. Thank you very much. Back to you, Samsung. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Okay, brilliant. So uh, just to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sam, so I'm an F1 doctor uh, working in the West Midlands, and this lecture will be on hypoxic emergencies. So how to deal with them, what they are, and what you need to do as an F1. So I'll talk through some scenarios and how to manage them. Okay, so uh, let's get going. So now, why do you guys um, think they're important? Another thing to mention is if you guys have any questions throughout, pop them in the um, in the comment box. And we've got Annabelle, another F1, who will keep an eye out, let me know if there's any questions. Uh, and we'll, we've also got clinical cases as we go along to keep you guys all, um, to, to make it as interactive as possible. And um, we can always address any questions that you have, okay? So uh, I'll just carry on. So. Why is hypoxia important and why are hypoxic emergencies important? You'll encounter them a lot as an F1, as I have um, working on respiratory. I've enc encountered a lot of hypoxic patients. Um, hypoxia can be life threatening and a lot of the time it can be a sign of deterioration. So you need to think about is this a sign of deterioration and what do I need to do to assess and manage these patients? Okay, so how can it present? So I want you to have a think for me. Um, how you think hypoxia, so low oxygen saturations, will present. So these are the different ways that hypoxia can present. Patients can become agitated, they can become confused. Um, you'll see on their saturation probes that their saturations are low. Um, you might see signs of poor perfusion, so where the, blue, where the lips are blue, you might check for um, uh, the looking at their hands, whether they've been perfused, um, and they might have difficulty in breathing as well. So these are all signs of hypoxia. Now, you need to remember that hypoxia is a medical emergency and uh, it's actually one of the most important um, things that you will encounter as an F1 um, and you really need to know how to identify, assess and manage it. So remember that a lot of the time, um, you need, what you need to do every time really is your ATE approach. So that's airway, breathing, circulation, disability, exposure. And remember, if you're concerned, you must must contact your senior. And if the patient's uh, really unwell, you need to put out a MET call, which is a medical emergency team call. Okay, so uh, let's have a think now about that ATE assessment I was mentioning. And uh, I'll speak about things uh, in terms of, say, if I was encountering a patient, what I would do. So if I found a patient who was hypoxic, how would I, how would I approach them? I would go to them and I would try to do an ATE assessment. So I'm sure many of you know what ATE uh, assessment consists of, but I want you to have a quick think and then we'll go through it. So just a couple of key points, like I mentioned, you should be able to start the basic management and often what this will uh, consist of is if the patient is quite hypoxic, so the saturations are quite low, say in the 19, say, say I see a patient who has COPD and their saturations are maybe 89% or, 89%, maybe about 85% or 80%. Um, that's low for them. That might be low for them. So uh, what I'm going to do is, if as long as their airway is okay, they're talking to me okay, I'm thinking about their breathing and their saturations, and I will put a 15-liter um, non-rebreathe mask onto them, and I'll ask the nurse to do that uh, if possible. And that's life-saving. That's going to give them the oxygen, the oxygen that they need uh, and really hopefully pick that saturation up as quickly as possible. And remember that um, it's not going to be forever, that 15 meters, that's to pick them up during that phase where they've deteriorated. And after that, you can decide what to do next. Because at the end of the day, it's the hypoxia that will kill them before the hypercapnia, hypercapnia being um, carb high carbon dioxide levels. 
So you need to give them the oxygen and that's what's going to really save their lives. So um, airway. So I hope you had enough time to think there. Um, I'm sure you did. Now, airway. So think about what, what types of issues I might, I might be encountering. So I might come to someone who's at, at sitting on their bed, they're breathing noisily. So have they got some sort of obstruction? Are they coughing? Have they aspirated something? Are they turning blue in the face? Have they, have they, uh, are, are they that compromised that they're now looking cyanosed? Are they struggling to breathe? Think about all of these different things. Now, moving on to breathing. So um, now, are they, are they having difficulty in breathing? Are they having to use their neck muscles, their accessory muscles to breathe? Do they look tired? Do they look like they've been panting away and now they're deteriorating so much that they're tiring? And tiring is a really, really uh, important and sign that you need to be able to identify because if someone's tiring, they're not going to be able to breathe in oxygen. They won't be able to breathe out carbon dioxide. And essentially that, that will cause significant deterioration. What's their respiratory rate? Are they panting away in front of you? Um, and what are those saturations? So things that you might do to try and uh, improve it, like I said, is the 15 liter non rebreathing mask. If you don't remember anything from this lecture, I want you to remember that. Um, if someone's deteriorating, they've got low oxygen saturations, um, whether that be 80% or whether that even be say 90% for someone who's usually 98% saturation, you need to stick them on that 15 liter non rebreathing mask um, and get them back up to the saturations. And then obviously consult your seniors and think about what oxygen they're going to go back on. Okay, and sit them up. Remember, sitting up can help with them to really expand that chest and use all those different muscles to help them breathe, okay? Now, let's think about uh, escalation. So um, you're only an F1 and you really need to escalate uh, the patients who you're worried about and patients who are hypoxic. Hypoxic is a life-threatening emergency and these patients need to be discussed with your seniors, okay? Remember, you're working in a team and remember your seniors are there to help you, okay? So if you're worried or if you're concerned about something, contact your senior, your senior whether that's your um, one of your colleagues, uh, one of the registrars, whoever it might be. Now, uh, let's think about how you're going to assess the, placement, uh, assess the patient in general and, and what things you'll be looking for. So if I've got a patient on, on, on a respiratory ward uh, and they're, they're on their bed, Panting away, they've got uh, they've got um, a low saturation of oxygen. I'll have a look. Are they on a drip? Do they have an IV fluids running? Have they um, developed any edema? Do they look like they're fluid overloaded? Um, I'll have a look at their at their calves, at their ankles. Have they got fluid there? Have they got any edema? How do their hands look? Do they have edema there? Uh, and remember, have a look at their JVP. So. Um, that will give you an idea again of their cardiac function uh, and whether they're fluid overloaded. Have they got a history of aspiration? So is this patient known to have difficulty in swallowing? Have they been eating whilst, when they're not meant to be eating? Are they nil by mouth because of risk of aspiration? So think about these things. Do they have an ECG going on? Do they have a cardiac event? Because something like a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, these types of things can precipitate hypoxia. So remember, you might want to look for, for an arrhythmia uh, or a problem there. And if they're on NIV, which is where you have, uh, it's called non-invasive ventilation. Um, at this point, you're an F1, you really need to be contacting your senior and, and really putting out a medical emergency call. Uh, because if someone is on NIV and deteriorating, it's, it's, it's a bad sign and you need some senior help there. Okay, so just moving on with the examination. Some of the things that I'll think about is, remember the ATE, so I'll be palpating the trachea. So is it deviated? Is it central? Um, I'll be listening to the chest on both sides. Has there been a new sound that I can hear? Um, are there crackles? Um, is there signs of fluid, fluid in the lungs? Have they got a wheeze? We've got to think about all of these things. Is it that now I can't hear lung sounds on one side, but I can hear some on the other side? So has this patient developed a spontaneous pneumothorax? Um, the other important thing is you need to do an ABG. So that's an arterial blood gas. This is probably one of the most important things you need to do in a patient who's hypoxic, okay? So um, this will give you some key information on the PO2, which is their oxygenation, and their PCO2, which is the carbon dioxide levels in their blood and the oxygen levels in their blood. 
And remember, you won't be able to do all of this at, at once, okay? So remember, you've got a team with you. So get your, your SHO, get your registrar here uh, if needed, okay? And work together with your, with your multidisciplinary team and they'll all be doing things to help uh, for the patient's benefit, okay? So remember, in some cases, the saturation machine might not actually tell you that this patient is saturating 80%. It might be so low that the saturation machine can't pick up the sats. And that's when the ABG is going to come in really handy. And uh, remember, you need to be conscious of how much oxygen that patient's on. Uh, a chest X-ray as well will be very, very useful uh, that you may need to order. So it might be a portable chest X-ray where the, the, the staff come to the patient and do the chest X-ray in emergency. And remember, try to address things in your ATV assessment as you go along. So if there's a problem with the airway, you address that before going to breathing. If there's a problem with breathing, you address that before going to circulation and so on. Okay. So let's think about oxygen targets now. So generally for most patients or not for most, but a lot of patients, you'll be aiming at 94 to 98%. So for you and you and me, for example, uh, with no respiratory disease, our saturation most likely will be 94 to 98% that we want those oxygen levels to be at. Now patients who um, may, have tar may have target saturations of 88 to 92%, these patients are those at risk of type two respiratory failure. So those who are at risk of retaining carbon dioxide. Now, the problem is to put it into simple terms, you and me without respiratory disease, if we had a buildup of carbon dioxide, um, our bodies would stimulate us to breathe, okay? And we would, we would breathe. However, these patients who struggle to get rid of the carbon dioxide in their blood, um, they retain carbon dioxide and that's over months, years, they have it in their blood and they're used to it. And therefore, that's not the thing that stimulates them to breathe. What stimulates them to breathe is their oxygen levels. And that's why we, with their oxygen levels being slightly low in the 88 to 92% region, that's what's going to stimulate them to breathe in and out, okay? So for the patients who are going to retain carbon dioxide, patients who, for example, have COPD, say a severely obese patient who doesn't breathe so much, it's hypoventilation, or those with um, some neurological disorders, sometimes they retain the carbon dioxide, so you'll be aiming for 88 to 92 percent. I hope that explains it. And uh, remember to do an ABG to confirm that they retain carbon dioxide. If you have any questions about that, pop it in the comment box. I know it is a little bit of a complex uh, idea to get your head around. Okay. So uh, let's see how switched on everyone is. Um, and I'm sure you all are. So this is a clinical case. Um, so we've got. Uh, so say I'm an F1. Uh, I'm on the ward, and we've got Mandy, who is a 71 year old. She's got a background of COPD. She's got some heart disease. She's got stable angina. Um, she's, got a, she's got an increased BMI and she has obstructive sleep apnea. So she's in a ward. Uh, I'm doing the ward run or part of the team doing the ward run. She acutely deteriorates, okay? Her respiratory rate has increased significantly to 31. She's tachycardic. Her blood pressure is okay, but her saturations are now 80%, okay? So that, that's quite low on four liters of oxygen. And she doesn't look very well. So I think that she's having ex an exacerbation of a COPD. So I want you guys to have a think, how would you assess this patient? And what investigations would you want to do? Okay, so remember you'll start at your bedside, okay? And you, you'll start from there, so an examination, so forth. So I will, I, I will uh, continue, okay? So like I mentioned, you'll start with your ATE assessment as you would do with all patients who are deteriorated, okay? You will, um, do you probably some blood tests if they haven't already been done? You'll need an arterial blood gas, so you need to do an AVG. And you probably end up requesting a chest X-ray as well. And remember, you'll be a part of a multidisciplinary team. So you'll have your different, uh, different members of the team helping you to do these different things, okay? Now, another question uh, for you guys. I want you to interpret this ABG. So this is of the same patient, okay, who's deteriorated with saturations of 80%. So I've done an AVG, okay, I will want to the analyzer and this is what it shows. So the pH is 7.27, so that's acidotic. Anything below 7.35 is acidotic. Um, anything above 7.45 is alkalotic. And I have a look at the other values. So PaO2 of 7.5, CO2 of 8.8 .8, and bicarb of 26. Now those are the normal ranges in the squared brackets. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about that. 
and then we'll move on and we'll explain. Okay, so I know that there is a bit of a there is a bit of a lag on Facebook Live, so I, I will continue to to tell you what the answer is. Um, and in fact, uh, the answer is that it is a respiratory uh, acidosis. Okay, so like I mentioned, the pH is seven point two seven. That's an acidosis. It's a respiratory acidosis because the carbon dioxide is high. Okay, and the oxygen is low. So as well as a respiratory acidosis, this is a type two respiratory failure. So where the patient is both hypoxic and hypercapnic. Okay, and I know that this is probably acute because the bicarb is not raised. The bicarb is just on the normal range, okay, it's 26. If it was raised, so say if it was around 30, 31, I'd be thinking more, this is probably a chronic thing because um, uh, chronically compensated by your kidneys and by a bicarb, uh, compensating for that. So, uh, so in summary, this is a type two respiratory failure, respiratory acidosis, okay? Now, just continuing with that case, you're still awaiting the chest x-ray because remember these things don't come back immediately and you're awaiting the bloods as well. So on your examination, you notice that bilaterally there's a, there's a wheeze and you've got reduced air entry at both the lung bases. So what are you going to do this, to manage this patient? Okay. So um, have a think and uh, I, I will continue um, to tell you what uh, what, what, how you'd manage this situation, okay? So I'm sure many of you will have got this. So it's remember, 15 litre non rebreather mask. This patient was saturating 80% on four litres of oxygen. So they're hypoxic and low amount of oxygen. So you need to pick that up. So put them on the 15 litre mask. That will really pick up that saturation quite quickly, probably within minutes uh, and um Nebulizers can be quite helpful in COPT exacerbation. So you can give them salbutamol and ipratropium nebulizers. And, and uh, of course, if they're not responding, you can give them that back to back. So once that finishes, uh, you can give them again. And nebulizers last probably around 20 minutes. So you know, assess the response after it. And remember, you need to contact your seniors early, especially with deteriorating patients like this. Now, in terms of the longer term management, you'd probably start prednisolone and you can speak to your seniors and uh, read the pages and mind the bleep to, to have a read about the longer term management of things like COPD exacerbation. Okay, uh, right. So now let's just quickly go through some of the really common uh, findings and situations you'll come across as, as an F1. So um, let's think about the differential diagnosis according to the examination findings. Okay, so um, just splitting it up here. We can start with a wheeze. So in what patients might you expect a wheeze? You can get it in patients with asthma, COPD, and even pulmonary edema when they have fluid overload, you might hear a wheeze. A vesicular, also known as, no, also known as normal breath sounds, um, you might find in patients with a pulmonary embolism. And we'll discuss pulmonary embolism a little bit later. Crackles, um, remember that this will be as a result of secretions, and it could be because of fluid overload. And remember to think about uh, pneumothorax if you're not hearing oxygen on one side. And remember, on the wards, you won't be able to know uh, what the differential diagnosis is immediately. There might be a number of things going on. So have, have, have that cap on where you're thinking um, about multifactorial different types of things. And remember, you'll have a team. So address the different things that you might need to give them a diuretic. You might give, need to give some IV furosemide as a, as a stat dose, 40 milligrams. If you, if you see the fluid overload and pulmonary edema. But they also might have an aspect of COPD exacerbation. So you might need to also give them some nebulizers. And of course, the all important oxygen. So uh, just have a think uh, of everything you'll be doing. So just a few um, important things to, to uh, remember and things you'll come across. So pulmonary edema. So this is an example of a chest x-ray showing pulmonary edema. So remember, you think about the causes. Is there a cardiac cause? presentation, um, are they coughing things up? Have they got a wheeze? What's their saturations? Uh, and if I've got a patient with pulmonary edema, I might see that there's fluid in their, in their arms and their legs. They might have a wheeze. Um, they, might, they might have some degree of cardiac failure. And uh, if I ask for an ECG, I might, I might see some finding. It might be that they have some Q waves indicating previous MI um, or, or things like this, or they might have a new MI. 
Um, so you know, there's, there's these important things you need to get done. And ABG, remember, you need to look at the oxygen saturations, the CO2 levels as well. Uh, remember, chest X-ray will be useful, bloods, and BNP, so brain natriuretic uh, peptide, will, will be helpful in terms of showing that strain of the heart. And remember, your immediate management will likely be oxygen, okay, and furosemide, which is a diuretic. Get your seniors involved, and uh, they will discuss with you the further management. Okay, so just moving on to acute asthma. So um, remember, you need to rule out different differentials. Like I mentioned, it might not be that a patient with asthma has a, is having an asthma attack. They might be having an anxiety attack. They might be having a myocardial infarction. So think think broadly, okay, when you approach your patients in a ward. So a remit examine, and with these with these patients again, oxygen nebulizers and and senior input. So so those would be some of the important things. And ju just to mention, okay, severity of asthma is very important. If someone in, is, is having a severe asthma attack, okay, or a life threatening asthma attack, you'll probably need to put out an emergency call, okay. So you probably need to put a medical emergency trauma call, or we call a medical emergency team call, a MET call out, because this is a life-threatening emergency, okay? And you really need the whole medical team. So that call will get out all the medical team from the hospital, uh, from wherever they are, they'll come to you, they'll come to that patient and really help, okay? So um, remember that if they have any one feature in these different categories, okay, they, um, they will fulfill that criteria. So if my patient looks at exhausted and, and, and tired, and thus is now retaining carbon dioxide and has a normal PaCO, has what we call a normal PaCO2 of four to six. That's actually a life-threatening sign, okay? So, so remember that. Now moving on to COPD. Um, so I know we discussed that a little bit before. So remember your differential diagnosis, your ATE assessment, your investigations, and your senior support and your management. So your oxygen, your nebulizers. And remember, um, if it's an infective exacerbation, have they got a fever? So uh, I'm going to check this patient's temperature. I'll ask, my, uh, ask the rest of the teams, or I can ask the nurses, do you mind doing a temperature check for me? Have they got a fever? I'll have a listen. Do they have any crackles? Is this an infective exacerbation? Are they septic? And now I'm sure you all know what the sepsis six is, but I'll run through it with you. And the way I remember it is through um, the word buffalo. Okay. So I uh, remember three in and three out. So sorry, give three and, and take three. So B for blood cultures, okay. Um, U for urine output. So I want to measure your, your hourly urine output through a catheter um, if needed. F for fluid resuscitation, might be that the blood pressure is low, maybe 100 over 50, and you need to give a bolus of maybe 250 mil stat if they, heart fail, if they have a degree of heart failure or heart problem, or 500 milliliter stat bolus of normal saline. Um, if they don't have any concerns with regard to fluid overload or heart failure. Um, so that's F. A for antibiotics, so I might need to start board spectrum antibiotics, but of course follow your hospital guidelines. L for lactate, so that's why you need either an arterial blood gas or venous blood gas, okay? And O for oxygen, so remember when you need to provide them that oxygen. And remember senior support, uh, because patients who have a degree of heart failure it might be a little bit tricky. Do I give them fluid or do I give them a diuretic? So, so think about these different things and that's why it's so important to have a senior. Now, a quick question for you all. Um, so this, there's a patient who has an exacerbation of COPD, an el elderly gentleman. He has a simple face mask or that has been on eight liters for the past few hours, okay? He's now drowsy and you're asked to review him by the nurse, okay? So his respirate is 10. Uh, so that's low, his blood pressure is okay, SATs of 99%, and have a look at his AVD. So 7.11 pH, carbon dioxide of 9.9, uh, oxygen of 18, and bifar of 31. So just normal ranges, again, pH normal range is 7.35 to 7.45. Carbon dioxide is um, 4 to 6. Oxygen is greater than 11 or so, and bicarb is around 22 to 26. So just bearing those things in mind, what do you think the first thing as an F1, what are you going to do when you come to see this patient? Okay, so the first thing to do, okay, is reduce the oxygen. The thing you need to bear in mind here is this patient has COPD, okay? 
they are retaining carbon dioxide clearly. The carbon dioxide is high on the gas. It's 9.9. They are very oxygenated. In fact, their oxygen levels are too high. Their PO2 is 18.1, okay? And they saturate on 99%. Likely, this patient who has COPD um, has some degree of carbon dioxide retention, okay, in the long term. And now, because the carbon dioxide is so high and the oxygen is so high, there's nothing to stimulate the breathing. And this is why in, carbon, in patients with COPD and at risk of carbon dioxide um, retention, we need to aim for sats of 88 to 92% so that that hypoxic drive is what stimulates them to breathe, okay? So by reducing the oxygen, it will stimulate that hypoxic drive, it will get that respiratory up, okay? Uh, and it will hopefully sort out that carbon dioxide, it will help them to blow it off and harmonize that oxygen as well. And they might not need so much oxygen. So remember, you need to speak with your seniors about this as well. And speak with the nurses, they might not realize what the um, target sets are. So remember, it's all a team effort, okay? So like we just explained, uh, that's that. So just definitions quickly. Hypoxia um, is where on, on the arterial gas, um, it's less than 10. And if they're severely hypoxic, it will be less than eight. So essentially they have low oxygen saturations, okay? Now type two respiratory failure is where they have hypoxia and hypercapnia. So we did dis uh, discuss that earlier. So PaO2 is low and uh, their, their CO2 is over six. Okay, so that's high. Um, right, so coming towards the end now, guys. Okay, almost finished. Um, so vesicular, i.e. normal breath sounds, um, you need to think about a pulmonary embolism. So these patients, you may, I've come across a lot of patients with pulmonary embolisms um, and their chest x-ray will be absolutely fine, okay? Um, their, their lungs will, will, uh, will, um, will, when you auscultate the lungs, they will sound completely fine. However, um, they might have uh, chest pain, they might have pain on breathing in, okay? Uh, which, is, which is along with a sinus tachycardia on the ECG, it could be a sign of pulmonary embolism. So in these patients, you need to get a D-dimer done, you need to speak with your seniors, they might need to get a CTPA. So that's a CT scan of the, of the, of the lungs. And, and from then on, you'll go on to manage with a heparin or so on and so forth. You'll discuss with your seniors, okay? And things like respiratory depression, remember, have a look at their drug chart, it's very important. If they're on, say, um, uh, morphine uh, and 10 times how much they're normally on, or they're post-op and they're just having lots and lots of morphine, just bear in mind, you might, there might be an opioid toxicity and need that naloxone, okay? So um, don't forget, just, just finishing up, don't forget circulation C. And um, we've got a brilliant lecture that's gonna be um, delivered next week on fluid prescribing, which will be really, really handy. And I really recommend watching that. Uh, and it will be helpful for, for you when thinking about what to give or how much fluid uh, you should you should give and what you need to think about D for disability and E for exposure. Um, remember that if someone's seriously deteriorating and may not survive or is really unwell, someone from the team uh, can contact the next of kin. Doesn't need to be the doctors; it can be nurses or the health or the healthcare staff. Okay, um, and then and remember um, that 15 liter non rebreathed mask is vital. Okay, it's very very important. So give that initially if someone's hypoxic. You won't be leaving them on that. Okay, so don't worry about that. You're going to wean after that and reassess them to see how they're responding, okay? So that's it from me. Um, I've got once uh, a couple of slides after this. Um, what I'd really like you to do, if possible, is be, uh, be um, please fill in the feedback, okay? Niraj will put in the web link in the, in the chat box, in the comment box. You can scan as well, okay? And give us the feedback. We really need it for our portfolios and you'll need it for your portfolios because you'll get a certificate. And uh, if you are interested in finding out about ePortfolios, um, do go ahead and watch the uh, webinar that I gave a few weeks ago. It's recorded, uh, it's on the Mind the Bleak Facebook page and uh, that should be handy. Okay, so uh, I'll give you a bit of time to, to scan that QR code. Um, I know I've whizzed through that. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat, back, the chat box. Uh, we've got Annabelle, um, and Niraj will keep an eye on that. And please give us detailed feedback. We, we, we really hope this has helped you. If you have any other questions, um, just let us know. 
Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully you you uh, have benefited. You'll receive a certificate you can put in your portfolio, uh, which will be good for you with an F1, uh, and, and also hopefully will help us as well. Okay, so um, just a final thing. Remember, if you're not sure, contact your senior uh, because hypoxia is, is life-threatening. Okay, so any questions? Uh, and I'll hand it to Niraj and Anava if there's any questions. Thank you so much for that, Samsul. That was brilliant. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. So starting off with one um, about life on the wards. So we have one from a user here saying, where would we expect to see NIV being used? Is it only on respiratory wards or is it somewhere else as well? Really good question. So um, you'll see NIV, often it will be used in intensive care. Okay, so in the ITU, the HDU, um, that's where you primarily see it used. NIV, um, it's not, NIV is, is one of those where if they're needing it, they really need some uh, close, close supervision and probably um, are quite unwell. So that it will likely be in ITU, HDU, okay? But uh, like I say, as an, as an F1, um, you won't really be managing uh, NIV patients. That will be something your seniors will be doing more so. And if you have anyone who is on an NIV who you're worried about, you know, always speak with your seniors. Brilliant. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, and the next question that we've got here is uh, more about the next lecture, really. It's, will you cover plasma light in the fluid lecture? Okay. Um, I'm not sure exactly of the content. But, uh, uh, you know, just, just uh, go ahead and attend it and I'm sure you'll find out. Lovely. I think what you said about um, always making sure you think of circulation causes for breathing problems is so important, especially when, as you say, on the ward, you don't have the diagnostic capabilities that you do when you're doing a, a scenario or an exam question because your x-ray hasn't come back yet. Someone is running your ABG or your VBG and you just don't know yet. So you've really got to keep an open mind as to why people are hypoxic. I think that was really helpful. No, no, very true. Very true. It's, it's really good to keep an open mind, like you say, um, and, and think about the different things you need to assess. Often patients don't have just one problem. There's many things you need to assess. So um, in, in real life, like you say, um, bear in mind, um, the different possibilities and try and target those, definitely. Mm. We've got another question come in saying, uh, it might sound silly, but how many litres of oxygen would you normally start with for any patient who might require oxygen support in A&E? Okay, really good question. So it's going to really, really be dependent on what their saturations are, okay? So um, say their saturations are 95%. You can always try them in one liter. Is that going to, well, to be honest, 95% is within the normal range of, of, of in general. You always want to, in general, you probably aim, if someone has target sets of 94 to 98%, then 95% will be fine. Say if someone's uh, having um, saturations of 90%, you can try a couple of liters, maybe two liters, and maybe that will be enough to get them back into the 94 to 98% range. So, you know, it can start off with nasal cannula, one to, one to, two, one to two liters, and you can go up from there, really. But uh, it depends on the, what their targets are, and, and it depends on how poorly they are as well. Okay, It might be that you need to give about 15 meter non rebreathe mask immediately, and then thereafter, think about uh, titrating it down, maybe to a simple face mask, and then to um, nasal cannula. So, so, that, so it really depends, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, really great question. Definitely not a silly question. No, no, definitely not a silly question. Lovely. I think that's all the questions we have at the moment. Um, the, there was an initial question saying, will a certificate be provided for this webinar? And the answer is yes. After um, in, And the way to get it is you just fill out the feedback form and then afterwards it will generate a certificate for you for coming to the webinar, um, which I think will also work presumably after we finished going live. Yeah. Um, so that's a little answer to that one. Um, and for the moment, that's all the questions we've got. Um, a follow-up question. So, okay, so um, the previous user has asked about the A&E, um, how many liters do you start on? So 
follow up question. Does that mean it's more of a trial and observe method than a rigid structure to follow? Most definitely, exactly. Uh, it will be dependent on each patient and their requirements and, and exactly it's what, whatever they manage. So some patient might need five liters, some patient might need one liter, some patient might not need anything. So it really depends exactly. And you, you, you assess the, you reassess their saturations whenever you give them oxygen and titrate it as you need to. Brilliant, yeah. Um, we've got another question here um, concerning clinical examination. So if there's, so um, this user's asking, fluid, if fluid fills at the base of the lungs first, does the fibrosis of the lungs also start at the base? Mm, good question. Um... I'm not too sure about that. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I think, I guess what, how I would interpret that is what you're listening for on examination. Because I think if you hear fibrosis, it tends to be like throughout the lung tissue rather than just at the bases. So a fibrosis chest will kind of sound like light or fine crackles throughout the chest rather than right at the bottom. But uh, fluid at the base of the lung will, feel, will sound like coarse crackles at the base of the lung. But the issue is, exactly as Samsul said, you've got consolidation that sounds like coarse crackles, but also fluid sounds like coarse crackles. So that's why you've got to keep an open mind when you're listening for it and you use things all together, like the ABG, the chest X-ray, advice from your seniors and other elements of the clinical examination, as Samsung mentioned in the A to E, to kind of give you an idea of why their chest is crackly. Yeah, brilliant answer. Yeah, no, I agree exactly. Uh, and we got another question in. Um, so Samsung, do all COPD patients always have target sats of 88 and above? No, not, not always, not always. Um, it's important to find out if they retain carbon dioxide. That's why often when patients are admitted to hospital with COPD, they, they'll have an ABG done. Um, and, and if they are retaining carbon dioxide, then that's when you would uh, put them on that, uh, on those target saturations of 88 to 92. Uh, if in doubt, contact your senior and generally, from what I've seen, um, most patients with COPD um, have been on 88 to 92 percent, but uh, not not all patients are okay. Um, and and remember, it's not just COPD patients; it, it might be patients with other types of respiratory disease who who are targeting uh, 88 to 92. So um, so uh, yeah, that, that's the answer to that. Really. Samson, can I just ask a question? Actually, it's mm -hmm. Niraj. Um, so this is something that always catches me out in exams, just following on from the 88% thing. So if you're unsure about, so you know, you know that you have a patient with COPD, but you're unsure about whether they're a retainer or not, but they're profoundly hypoxic, presumably you would just give them high flow oxygen uh, because the hypoxia could kill them quicker than the hypercapnia could. Is that right? 100% right. That's exactly the right answer. Um, even if they retain, if they're retaining carbon dioxide, if they're hypoxic, it doesn't matter um, if, they're, if they're a COPD retainer and if they have low target saturations, um, you really need to pick that oxygen up. So if it says like 80% or something like that, get them on that 15 litre non rebreed mask because it's the hypoxia that's going to kill them first before the hypercapnia, before those high carbon dioxide levels. Hypoxia can kill someone without minute, with, within minutes. Hypercapnia um, takes longer, maybe, you know, hours uh, longer long, longer than minutes so um you really need to manage that hypoxia with the 15 liter non rebreathe mask exactly right yeah yeah and i think that is a really important question because especially when revising for exams and you hear about this quite counterintuitive point that if you give too much oxygen to someone who's a co2 retainer you're going to hurt them and it's exactly as you said hypoxia kills before hypercapnia but it often trips people up because they think oh well in this scenario i won't give oxygen yet because what if they're a retainer what if what if but actually you've got to always go for the basics which is hypoxia kills and hypo exactly hypoxia kills in minutes and hypercapnia will take hours 
Um, and so I think a really, really important question to go through. Um, that's all the questions that we've got at the moment up to date. Was there any um, cases that you've seen recently, Samsel, that made you um, include certain things in your lecture? Um, so, so some of the things that I've mentioned today, yeah. So um, the things that I've encountered and, and um, something you probably mentioned is that uh, as F1s, you'll, you'll encounter a lot of different cases and um, you might not feel so confident now, but you know, as, as you train and as you practice as an F1, you'll become a lot more confident. And this is just providing you the basis of your knowledge and uh, and and just um, some revision of some really important topics. Uh, remember, the Mind the Deep website has a lot of, of different um, really good resources. So, um, you know, give give everything a read. And uh, yeah, the, the the these cases definitely had things that I've seen, um, and and they are common. So remember your AT assessment, your basic for fifteen meters uh, to give when patients are hypoxic. And remember, you're only an F1. You need to speak with your seniors and really raise things uh, with your team members and put out an emergency call if you are concerned. Okay, those I'd say are the key uh, take-home points. Brilliant. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point to end on. And exactly as you say, where you know you've you've got a team, escalate if you're not sure. Go back to your basics, and you'll be absolutely fine. And lots to learn, as always. Mm -hmm. Lovely. So shall we leave it there in that case? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Thanks very much, guys. Um, I think that was a really, really interesting lecture. Um, thanks to the audience for sending in lots of very useful questions. Um, if you have any more, then please do keep commenting on Facebook. We will pick them up and make sure you join us next time for our fluid prescribing seminar. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you.